gyroscope here. If I can spin it up, you can see that it does, but I think every kid knows it's true. Now, if you pivot that one direction, it goes one way. You pivot the other way, it goes the other way. If I turn it around 180 degrees, now if I push it up, it goes the opposite direction. Push it up, it goes the opposite direction. If I go parallel, it does not pivot. As long as I maintain a parallel position, that's exactly what happens when you move a conductor through a magnetic field. You push down on it, the current goes in one direction. You push up, it goes in the opposite direction. You turn the magnet over 180 degrees, everything will reverse. You push down parallel to the lines of force uh, with the copper wire, and you get nothing. It told me that the energy in a magnetic field was a gyroscopic particle. Now, I didn't care what the rest of the world was saying because they couldn't answer my honest question. It was obvious to me the energy in a magnetic field consists of gyroscopic particles. It is a mechanical essence of Einstein's equation of equals mc squared. It moves forward at c and it spins at c. That's Einstein's equation of equals mc squared. It only occurs when you get atom alignment in material. I don't care if it's conductor or iron, what it is. When the atoms align, the magnetic field will appear. Come outside the boundaries of the material and gives you a running river that you can tap into. And what I'm going to show you is an energy technology that's going to totally change your life that the status quo power brokers have been fighting, and I'll show you the history of it. They didn't want you to have it, but you can see for yourself that this works. And the part of this for you to see it is to watch these meters because these meters are going to show you that there's more power in this system than flows from this battery. The magnet runs down this shaft from one end to the other. It's hex shaped with six sided. This blue represents a coil running this way. The red represents a coil running at right angles to it. The commentator shows that you break that circuit every 90 degrees. So you fire into one coil, fire into the next coil. Now you notice this gets higher as it's running because the battery start getting ch charged. Now this one's going from 200 up to 400. You see that there's more current being produced by this system than those batteries are capable of delivering because batteries will not produce RF power. So the RF power must be coming from the motor. Now RF power is true power and the way you know this, this meter only works by converting the heat and the heat is converted into electricity because it runs through a resistor. It's a very accurate measuring device. So you well over twice the current is flowing in this system than these batteries are capable of delivering. And the batteries cannot produce RF power. Now this is real power. It has to be coming from the system. It clearly shows that the energy output of the system is greater than the energy input into the system. And that's what I've been saying. That's what's more than 30 scientists who came to my home from around the world. Some of them came my way from England, signed affidavits that the invention worked. Uh, the special master to the court, Mr. William Schuyler, who was a former commissioner of patents. Um, he was an electrical engineer. The federal judge chose him, saying his credentials were superb. He looked at those affidavits and gave the men the credit they were due. He said the evidence was overwhelming. The invention worked. There was no contradictory factual evidence and the patent office had normally not followed the formalities of the patent law. To us as an observer, we see everything as motionless. We see objects and they sit still and everything in the shop sits still. And so we think that's to us, again, as to the observer, we think the natural state of our planet is non-motion. But when re in reality, you get down to the basic bank up of the atoms of this material and you see that the natural state of the universe is motion. The unnatural state is what I have concluded is the lack of motion to the observer because that's when it, can, it forms into something and becomes a solid mass that will be interreacted by other masses sitting close to it that causes it to sit still and not be able to travel because of its attraction. So we come along as the observer and we say the natural state of the, of the planets and the universe is lack of motion. Just like uh, we believe that so strongly just several hundred years ago, we believe that the uh, Earth was the center of the universe and that uh, <coughs> we were everything and they even believed that the stars, even back at Kepler times, was only uh, like a cake full of raisins three miles thick and the stars were little tiny raisins in it. And that was our bias and our prejudice based on what we saw that everything should centralize around us. And uh, I'm saying now we should open our eyes and our brain to see the magnitude of what lays in front of us. Space travel will become a reality. Uh, 
our children growing up will have an excitement and a, uh, a universe to travel into, but the values of the human race has to change with that. While Joe Newman is still fighting for recognition and just compensation, many entrepreneurs are racing to be the first into the marketplace with magnetic motors that are built with high-tech space-age materials and employ microprocessors to regulate pulsations and RPM. David Porter of Galtech Semiconductors demonstrates his recently patented permanent magnet motor called the Carousel Electric Generator. This is the latest version of the Carousel Motor Generator. Uh, it's a rotary version, a rotary inside. There's 18 separate sections, what we call a coil section in here. 18 make up the outer diameter. Uh, there's six coils here that we're using to drive the motor. And the top here we have an encoder which sends a pulse down to the electronics and basically lets the electronics know where the rotor, the rotating part here, is in relationship to the coils and tells the coils when to turn on and off. Uh, that's done by a specific index point that the encoder has that sets the relationship between the two and the electronics down here in the box is basically a set of uh, TTL logic counters. It counts the number of pulses from the encoder and it turns the power on and off to different coils depending on where the rotor is at the time. We have also hooked up to this system a connection to the computer over here. What it gives us the opportunity to do is change the duty cycle on the system. We can change it from a pulse rate of one pulse per cycle up to uh, 40 pulses per cycle, which would be a 100% duty cycle. Uh, that is incorporated in, and what we do is change the pulse rate on the computer. It downloads the data to the electronics. When the index pulse comes around, which comes around once per revolution, it updates the data in the counters, and that's what changes the pulse rate on the system. Okay, we don't have an automatic start on the system right now. That's something that the Intel chip will do. We'll start it up at a pulse rate of approximately 13 pulses, which gives us a 16% duty cycle. It takes a while to spool up, um, because like I say, it works also as its own flywheel. So we build up the power gradually. The thing about this system is, is that everything floats on the magnetic field in there. Uh, you have very little internal friction. Once the system gets up to speed, it stabilizes at a certain RPM. Right now we're running at about a 30% duty cycle per channel. The speed is still coming up a little bit. Calculate the speed off of the scope here and we're running about 1850 RPM. This white and the green shows the two channels on the motor. The little spikes there are the amount of time that each channel is on, and the flat part at the bottom is the amount that it's off. So you can see how much is pulsing and how much time it's off and how much time it's on. One of the analogies we like to use is, it's like uh, if you pick someone up and take them across the street, you use a lot of energy. If you put them in a tire, once you get it started, all you gotta do is tap it a little bit. And so you use a lot less energy to move the same load. And that's what we do. We build it up to a high speed, and then we just tap it with a little, with a little juice as it goes around. And we use the inertia built into the system to take it the rest, the rest of the way there. So we're using a, a high speed pulse on the system. What we're doing is removing the energy from the magnet. The magnet has a specific life. They lose approximately 1% a year. So we're not actually trying to create energy from nothing. The system will not run forever. It's not perpetual motion. Uh, we use the amount of energy that is in the magnets. Once that energy is used up, 
the magnets can be taken out, they can be recharged. All we're doing is maximizing the efficiency of the electromagnetic flux density that's there to the production of electrical output. When will we be able to see free energy devices powering consumer products like this electric car? Well, they're already here, and you may be able to purchase one by the time you see this program. In Oklahoma, where oil has been king for over a century, inventor Troy Reed has been busy in his shop constructing rotating magnetic motors that he believes will soon revolutionize how we get around. And it does work. This is a new prototype of the magnetic motor, and if I can explain a little bit about what you call a magnetic field. All magnets, the big old wooden prototype, has a system. As the motor went over, it had a tension to jerk. Jerk over, like that. If you take this motor here, and you take your finger and rotate it, it doesn't have that jerking in it. So what I've done, I got rid of the crankshaft. I got rid of the crankshaft. I've got rid of, of the, the injectors. And the system in this motor here, as you crank this motor up, and like you do the other one, the motor will start running. And uh, what I'll do, I'll energize it on this motor here. If you can see these amp gauges over here, this will come, when we get it up to about 150 volts, we'll unplug it and we'll turn the light on. If you turn this around where you can see this side here, all the working parts is behind this system here, operates from a little computer. It takes just five volts, it's 150 volts. What we're going to do, turn off all the switches, make sure there ain't nothing plugged into it. There's the plug. There's your 110 volts. Motor's still running. You can operate this table plumb around. Still got energy running. Nothing tied up in the back of it. Nothing on the floor. Rotate around, still running up running electricity. So we're looking, hoping, hoping this time next year that you'll be able to use it in your home. So that's another. And what's good about this, you're talking about electric automobiles. This car, this right here can set it in back of an electric automobile and generate electricity and charge batteries up in a car. You can drive it anywhere you want to. You don't pollute the air. All the other electric automobiles that I've actually seen has been nothing but this standard transmission. This is an automatic transmission car. There's not a whole lot of what's called junk. I would call under cars. Uh, I've seen a lot of electric cars that had a lot of stuff in it. Only thing that this has has a battery to run the uh, 